I bet you didn't know this. Ring Around the Rosy is about the bubonic plague. A rosy ring rash, herbs and posies were stuck in the beak part of plague doctor's masks. To cover the smell of death. Ashes because they burn the bodies to prevent the spread of infection. And they all fall down. I bet you didn't know the actual meaning of three blind mice. It's about three protestant bishops of Queen Mary. Hugh Latimer, Nicholas Radley, and Thomas Kramer. They tried to overthrow a Bloody Mary in favor for her sister Elizabeth. They were tortured, dismembered, and burned at the stake. And they were considered blinded by their religious beliefs. Bet you didn't know this. Rockabye Baby is far from sweet and innocent. It's about King James II's infant son. So it's literally a death wish to an infant. A song wishing his death so he wouldn't get heir to the throne. So the sweet lullaby, not so much. I bet you don't know this about the famous Kennedy family. John F. Kennedy had a sister named Rosemary. She suffered some pretty severe mental health issues and also had promiscuous behavior. Her father, Joseph Kennedy, decided that this could affect his son's political career, so he did the unthinkable. At the young age of 23, her father forced her to undergo a lobotomy. A lobotomy is an old medical procedure. They would use an ice pick-like device to go up behind your eyelid, into behind your eye, and mutilate the frontal lobe of your brain. During the procedure, there was zero anesthesia and Rosemary was completely awake. They had her recite poetry to them so that they know she was still conscious. The procedure was considered over when Rosemary could no longer speak or move on her own. Because she was now paralyzed and could no longer speak, she spent the last 64 years of her life in various mental institutions. Her father refused her any rights to visitors. It wasn't until her father fell ill in the later years of Rosemary's life that her siblings were finally able to reunite with her. Bet you didn't know that Mary Mary Quite Contrary isn't actually about a woman gardening. It's actually about Queen Mary, better known as Bloody Mary. Her growing gardens are actually graveyards. Silver bells were torture devices used for crushing thumbs. Cockle shells were torture devices used for mutilating genitals. Pretty Maids is actually a reference to the Rose of Iron Maidens. Not so innocent after all. I bet you didn't know that Goosey Goosey Gander isn't just a silly little nursery rhyme. Back in 16th century England, it was frowned upon to be Catholic. Catholic prayer was illegal, and if you were caught, you were punished. What was the most popular form of punishment? Tying a rope to one leg and throwing them down a flight of stairs. Pull them back up, repeat. Yeah, you see how this ends. I bet you didn't know you could sue people for emotional distress. All you have to do is document your emotional state. Emotional distress is fear, anxiety, crying, lack of sleep, depression, and humiliation. And you can totally take someone to court for that. I'm finna be rich. Bet you didn't know this. The origin behind this TikTok sound is actually pretty sad. The audio is of someone's cat right before it died. They then took it, slowed it down, and made it into what you're hearing now. If you don't believe me, let me show you. <coughs> Told ya. I bet you didn't know why female mummies are always found more decomposed than male mummies. That's because male mummies were embalmed way sooner than female. And why is that? Because they were taken to the family home to give them a chance to decompose some. Allowing them to decompose prevented necrophilia. Necrophilia was apparently a big issue with the embalmers. And for those who don't know, necrophilia is sexual intercourse with or attraction towards corpses. Yeah, that's pretty disgusting. I absolutely bet you've never heard of goat tongue torture. It was a torture tactic that was commonly used in the medieval times. They would take the victim and tie their legs to a tree. Their feet would be left exposed and continuously covered in salt water. There would then be a goat tethered to the tree and goats love salty flavor. So the goat would stand there and continuously lick the bottom of the victim's feet. Now this seems fine at first, but if you don't know about goat tongues, they aren't exactly soft. They're actually pretty rough. Once the salt water would dry, it would be reapplied so the goat can keep on licking. It tickles at first, but the more the goat licks, the more that the skin starts to come away. Eventually, you would have bloody, salty feet that the goat are going to continue to lick on. So it'll go from tickling to extreme, excruciating pain as your nerve endings are being exposed by the goat's tongue. If not stopped, the body would eventually go into shock and the victim would be left to die. I'm betting you don't actually know what happens to a body before a funeral. There's a lot more to it than just embalming it. Your eyes sink in when you die. So they use spiked contacts to anchor to the eye to make it look like your eyes are still full. Your blood is draining and you're pumped full of embalming fluid. If you needed an autopsy, all of your organs are sitting in your abdomen in a plastic bag. Not everything is always there. Let's say you donated your bones to science. 
they'll take your leg out and replace it with a PVC pipe. Your body is completely stiff. It's also on a metal rack in the casket. Keep the body stable. They use wire to sew your jaw shut, glue your lips together, and glue your eyelids closed. The worst, in my opinion, is a plastic plug they stick up your butt to prevent you from leaking into the casket. Then they slather you with makeup to make you still look alive. If I'm not immediately cremated after I die, I'm haunting everyone. I bet you don't know about the torture device, the Judas Cradle. Back in medieval times, this one was pretty popular. They start out with a triangular piece of wood, just like this. Not always, but sometimes they would apply oil. Then they would set the victim on the wooden piece, backside first. When it sounds like it can't get any worse than that, it does. After the victim is already insanely uncomfortable, they tie their feet together. After tying their feet together, they start applying weights. Now they would do this in slow increments. They wouldn't just drop one big weight at once. Slow increments so that they'll just slowly slide down. Now the victim, probably no matter what, is gonna end up dying in this situation. From either shock, blood loss, being impaled. So yeah, if he ended up on the Judas Cradle, it didn't end well. Bet you didn't know this about barbers. Back in the Middle Ages, your barber was also your surgeon and your dentist. From cutting hair to amputating limbs and pulling teeth. Now there are a few different theories about this one, but this seems to be the most popular. The color of the barber pole. Red is for the aortic blood during bloodletting. Blue for the veins. And white for bandages. So imagine getting your hair cut by your barber and suddenly they're like, wait, 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 I'll be right back. I gotta go pull this dude's tooth real quick. Bet you don't know how a human body decomposes. Now this is normal conditions without extreme heat or extreme cold. But there are four different stages. Stage one, self-digestion, when the body literally starts to eat itself. This starts immediately after death. Since everything stopped, carbon monoxide starts building up in the body and creating an acidic environment. Membranes and cells start rupturing and they release enzymes that start devouring the body. Rigor mortis kicks in and you get small blisters all over. And stage two, the bloating stage. The enzymes from stage one start releasing gases. This causes the body to more than double in size. This is also when it starts to smell. All the bacteria from your decomposing body leaves a putrid, rank scent. Stage three, active decay. This is when your organs, muscles, and skin liquefy. This is also the stage where your teeth fall out. The body decomposes at the fastest rate at this point. And stage four, you become a skeleton. And that's how a body decomposes. I bet you don't know why chainsaws were originally invented. It was invented by two doctors in 1780, but not used for cutting trees like you'd think. They were used in assisting childbirth. They were made so it would be easier to remove the pelvic bone and be less time consuming. There was no motor. It was powered by a hand crank, which spun a chain that had a bunch of tiny serrated teeth on it. To make things worse, anesthesia wasn't invented until 1846. That sounds super brutal. I bet you didn't know about this medieval torture device. This one was almost exclusively used on women. The Breast Ripper. <gasps> oh no. It started being used in the 1590s. It was an iron torture device that had four claws. It was also usually heated before use. And it would do pretty much exactly what the name says. The four claws would clamp around the breast and they would begin to slowly pull them away. The point of this torture was to completely rip the breast from the body. That. Bet you didn't know there was an old form of torture that used bamboo. After World War II, stories circulated of Japanese soldiers using bamboo tortures on prisoners of war. How this would work is they would securely tie someone above young bamboo shoots. And if you don't know, bamboo grows incredibly fast, especially over three days. Bamboo is also strong enough to grow directly through asphalt. So of course it could grow straight through the body. So over the span of three days, the bamboo would grow up and penetrate through the body slowly. Eventually the prisoner would fall victim to blood loss and shock. They would then leave the body with bamboo shoots growing through it so that the enemy could find them. I bet you didn't know there was a disease that almost exclusively affects cannibals. I'm talking about Kuru. It was most prevalent in the 1950s and 60s. It affected the four people in the highlands of New Guinea. They used cannibalism as a funeral ritual. This disease only really affected women and children because during the ritual, it was practiced that women and children would eat the brain of the deceased loved one. Since Kuru can lay dormant in the body for up to 10 years, they didn't know if they were eating the brain of someone who was infected. But consumption of the brain is pretty much one of the only ways it could be transmitted. Once someone started showing symptoms, it was a rapid onset. Within a year of the first symptoms, they would succumb to the disease. 
Now the symptoms is where it gets kind of crazy. It would cause fits of maniacal, uncontrollable laughter, complete loss of coordination, behavioral issues, dementia, the inability to eat and swallow, so it would cause severe malnutrition, involuntary body movements, complete unexpected outbursts of rage, and fits of sobbing. In the final stages of the disease, they are left incontinent, bedridden, and unable to move on their own. One of the weirdest symptoms though, people who did in fact have Kuru, usually they didn't even care. Because of what it does to the mind, they literally did not process that they had this disease. There was no known cure and it was always fatal. Now you probably think this only happened in the 1950s and 60s, but believe it or not, the last recorded case of Kuru was in 2010. I bet you've never heard of scaphism. It was a form of ancient Persian execution. How this would work is they would take a victim and place them between two boats. They would leave the limbs exposed and push them out into the water. Someone would they go out on a boat and force feed the prisoner milk and honey. Now when this is done, especially in hot weather, the victim becomes violently ill. And when they do, I can imagine you know what happens. So then the victim is left floating across a body of water. Over time, small creatures start moving in. Insects, vermin, birds. They would all start swarming and eating alive the victim. Then whatever is living in the water takes care of the limbs. The thing is though, is that what caused them to perish usually wasn't being eaten alive. Shock and infection is usually what took them out long before anything else could. In some cases, the victim lived up to a week before they succumbed to the torture. I bet you didn't know there was a form of torture that involved rats. It was very first recorded in 17th century England. How this would work, they would tie the victim to a table-like structure. They would then place a rat in a half cage over the victim's abdomen. Doesn't seem so bad yet. They would then take something to heat up the exterior of the cage, usually something like a torch. That's when the rats would start to freak out. They would then make desperate attempts to escape the heat source. And the only way out was to burrow through the victim's abdomen. So the rats would begin clawing and biting at the skin. Once they went through the skin, they moved on to internal organs. Even if the torture was stopped before the rats reached your insides, the victim would almost always succumb to infection. I bet you don't know what Cotard syndrome is, also known as walking corpse syndrome. It makes you believe that part of your body is missing, that you're actively dying, already dead, or don't even exist at all. Walking corpse syndrome is extremely rare and only affects 200 people worldwide. People with walking corpse syndrome usually become very antisocial. Sometimes they stop speaking altogether. Some people affected may hear voices that they are dead or actively dying. It's usually triggered by another medical condition, like dementia, epilepsy, migraine, or stroke. Some believe it can also come from brain damage. Many who have it already have a history of mental health issues, such as depression, anxiety, and schizophrenia. Now it can't be cured, but it can be treated. Treatment usually consists of antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, antipsychotics, and extensive therapy. I bet you've never heard of Giles Corey. He was a victim in the Salem witch trials, but he refused to plead guilty to witchcraft. So in an attempt to get him to plead guilty, they started crushing him. How they did this was they forced him to lay on the ground and put a plank over him. And slowly, one by one, they'd start adding weights. The more weight that is added, the more bones that it crushes, constricts the breathing, and if the weight is not released, eventually it would cause the victim to perish. Here's the thing though, Giles refused to plead guilty. It took two days for him to succumb to the crushing. And the only thing he said the whole time was add more weight. I bet you don't know who Stephen J. Shannonbrook is, or at least what he's famous for. He's known for making candy, not just any regular candy though. Chocolate candy that is made from the casting of human body parts. What makes it so unique? The people he used for the castings weren't alive. So in 1995, he visited morgues in Russia and North America. That's where he would get his castings. Most popular being eyes, ears, and wounds from cadavers. I bet you've never heard of Michael Mallory, the man who refused to let his life end. In 1933, in a speakeasy in New York, five friends hatched a plan. They were going to befriend a homeless man named Michael Mallory, take out an insurance policy on him, end his life, and then pocket the funds. They thought this would be easy since Michael Mallory had a drinking problem. Since he drank his brains out every night, they figured it would solve itself. But night after night, Michael Mallory returned just to continue drinking. 
Getting impatient, the five friends decided to add antifreeze to Michael Mallory's drinks. Yet, he still kept coming back every night and drinking. When that didn't work, they moved on to turpentine in his drinks. Again, Michael Mallory kept drinking his drinks and coming back every night. So they decided to move on to rat poison. But that didn't work either. So then they decided they were going to make him a sandwich. It had spoiled sardines, rat poison, and carpet tacks. Yet Michael Mallory ate it happily and returned again the next day. The friends decided that they were getting impatient and that Michael Mallory had an iron stomach and so food and drink wasn't going to cut it. So they waited one night for him to wander out of the speakeasy. When they found him passed out on the snow, they covered him with water, hoping he would freeze. Nope, instead Michael Mallory woke up, went back to the speakeasy, and slept on the floor. The five friends are getting desperate at this point, so they finally hire a cab driver. They were going to pay this cab driver to run Michael Mallory over, which he very much so did. But Michael Mallory only suffered several broken bones and had a short stint in the hospital, and he was able to quickly recover. The five friends decided enough was enough and they had to get more brutal. They waited for a night where Michael Mallory passed out once again, stuck a gas nozzle into his mouth, and turned on the gas pump. Fortunately, though, they didn't get away with it. When Michael Mallory's body was examined, they realized he had passed from carbon monoxide poisoning, which opened the investigation where the five friends were caught. All because the cab driver cracked under interrogation. I bet you've never heard of amorphous globosis. It mostly affects cattle but has sometimes been found in other animals. Now, it's not 100% understood, but it almost always occurs with twin pregnancies. One of the embryos develops perfectly. The other one develops, eh, not so great. Instead, they come out as a spherical sack with skin and hair, just like a normal cow. But what's inside the sphere can be different. Sometimes it's organs, sometimes it's bones, sometimes it's both. Sometimes it's just muscle tissue. But the craziest part to me there was one case of amorphous globosis in humans. I bet you don't know this about the Kennedy family curse. There were a string of untimely accidents. Too many to be considered a coincidence. Some like to chalk it up to bad luck. Others consider it a curse. Everyone knows what happened to John F. Kennedy and to what happened to his brother, Robert F. Kennedy. But do you know about all the others? Do you know about the fatal crash that JFK Jr., his wife, and sister-in-law were in? 35 years prior, Ted Kennedy was in a plane crash. Though he survived, he suffered a broken back and broken ribs. Joe Kennedy Jr. was in a fatal plane crash in World War II. Kathleen Kennedy was in a fatal plane crash in France while flying during a storm. David Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy's son, was a victim to an overdose. Robert F. Kennedy's other son, Michael, was in a fatal skiing accident. Then there was Rosemary Kennedy's botched lobotomy, which I have a whole video about. John and Jackie Kennedy lost their third child, Patrick, he was only two days old. And Ted Kennedy's son, Edward Jr., lost his leg to bone cancer when he was 12 years old. I bet you've never heard of horse hair worms. They're a parasite and somewhat like a nematode. But they do more than just feed off the host. They can only thrive in invertebrates, such as crickets, beetles, water bugs, praying mantises, and grasshoppers. They start their life cycle out in the water, where they're ingested by mayflies or mosquitoes. That's how they're transferred to the other bugs. Once the larva reaches a host, it starts to rapidly grow. Some species get up to six feet or two meters. Once they reach their adult size in the host, they cause them to seek out a body of water. Some of the invertebrates it infects actually avoid water usually. So they literally cause the invertebrate to seek out water where it will definitely drown. But that's not the worst part. Once in the water, the horsehair will bore out of the invertebrate's body. Craziest part, they don't even have a mouth, so scientists don't even know how they bore out of the body. The behavior of the insect never changes, either. The whole time it's infected with the parasite, it behaves normally. Well, besides the whole drowning part. Once the horsehair worm is in a body of water, it goes on to find a mate, and the cycle continues. Now that I've grossed you out, don't worry. Humans cannot contract this parasite. That we know of. Okay, obviously you know who Ted Bundy is. But I bet you didn't know this about him. In 1970, he saved a three-year-old boy from drowning. He fell into Seattle's Green Lake and Bundy was the first one to spot him. So he dove in and rescued him. The boy ended up being totally fine. I bet you also didn't know that Bundy worked for an unalive prevention hotline. That's right, he would answer the phone all day and help people find their will to live. 
he also wrote an assault prevention pamphlet. But probably the weirdest for me, he was the assistant director of the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Commission. I bet you didn't know that being buried alive was a pretty rational fear in the 18th and 19th century. Because medical science wasn't very advanced, it was more common than you'd assume. So common that they fitted coffins with safety measures. Many were fitted with tubes for breathing, which also means the victim could be heard from underground as well. Some were fitted with bells and glass windows. Others were made like a jack-in-the-box device. That means when the device was hit, it would spring open. But the jack-in-the-box method didn't work so great because when the body would start to swell when they actually were decomposing, it would cause the coffin to spring open. Some had flags, ladders, minor explosions, all kinds of things to get the groundkeeper's attention. At one point, they started burying people in chambers above ground. It would have a glass window so you could see directly inside and a string tied around their finger connected to a bell. That way, if the groundskeeper heard the bell ringing, they could immediately run over and open the vault. Despite all these safety measures, it wasn't always successful. There has been plenty of evidence from exhumed graves to reveal that people had been alive inside the coffin. They have tattered clothes, they'll be rolled over, their fingernails will be completely gone from trying to claw their way out. With Western popularization of embalming, this is practically unheard of now. It isn't impossible though. The last case of premature burial that we're aware of was only in 2018. I got a lot of requests asking about the 2018 case of premature burial. In 2018, a Brazilian woman had supposedly succumbed to septic shock. The family of this woman were contacted by people who lived close to the gravesite. They told the family they could hear moans and screams coming from underground. The family contacted authorities and they swore that there was no possible way she could still be alive. 11 days after her original funeral, the family decided they were going to exhume the grave themselves. When they dug her up, they couldn't believe what they found. She had wounds on her fingers and forehead from trying to escape, to the point where her fingers were so worn down from trying to claw through the wood. The original nails on the coffin were actually loose from her trying to get out. The worst part, she was still warm to the touch. So of course the family contacted authorities to let them know there had been a mistake. Instead of punishing the people actually who were responsible, the family is now facing charges for defiling a grave. I bet you didn't know about Pedro Lopez. He is known as a monster of Andes. With over 300 victims from 1969 to 1980, majority of them were women and children. But he was freed by the government of Ecuador at the end of 1998 on a $50 bond. Here's the kicker. To this day, no one knows where he is. I bet you don't know about the most brutal torture device designed in ancient Greece. I'm talking about the brazen bull. It was a bull made completely out of bronze with a door on the side. It was completely hollow with the only other openings being holes at the ends of the horns. How this would work is they would put the victim inside the brazen bull. Once they were inside, they would light a fire underneath it. And obviously bronze gets pretty hot pretty quickly under fire. So the victim would be inside and literally start cooking alive. The holes in the horns had a purpose. When the victim screamed from inside the brazen bull, it would bellow out through the horns. And they supposedly say it sounded like an angry bull. The craziest part though was the first victim of the brazen bull. It was Perillos of Athens, who is a man who created it himself. He wanted to prove it worked. So he crawled in becoming trapped. And sure enough, he succumbed to the torture. I bet you don't know about being hanged, drawn, and quartered. It was first recorded in England in the 13th century. It was a statutory punishment for treason in 1351. It would start with the victim being strapped to a board and dragged to the site. A rope would be around their neck as they're being dragged so they would be choked and gagged while also getting injuries from being dragged across the ground. If you're fortunate enough, you wouldn't make it to the second part, the drawing. They would make a cut across the victim's abdomen and they would start pulling out what's inside. What's down below would be mutilated. And if you were unfortunate enough to still be hanging around, you'd have to watch as they lit what they pulled out of you on fire. Of course, then you get quartered. You'd be chopped up and different parts would be sent to prominent parts of the country. Oh, and the head would be sent to an infamous tower in London where it would be stuck outside on a stake. I bet you don't know about the pair of anguish. Or maybe you do because this one's been highly requested. It was a medieval torture device. It was shaped like a pear, 
with three or four spoon-like structures that would stretch out at the turning of the key. Now, it depends what you're being punished for because that's what decides where the pair of anguish goes. Sometimes it was put in the mouth, which would cause the jaw and teeth to break. It also was inserted in other body openings, but it wasn't immediately fatal. They claim you wouldn't succumb to your injuries. Instead, it would be the infection from the wounds it caused. I bet you don't know what actually makes crucifixion lethal. Obviously, we know the most famous crucifixion, but there is one part that a lot of people don't know. It was originally created by the Romans. People most commonly think they starved to death, died of dehydration, or some people even assume blood loss. But it was actually asphyxiation. They would have your feet nailed to a small plank. As long as you could hold your weight up, it would be easier for you to breathe. But the more fatigue set in and the more you can't hold your own weight up, with the way your arms are positioned, it would start to crush your lungs. Sometimes, if it wasn't working fast enough for the Romans, they would break the kneecaps so they couldn't hold up their own weight. So it would cause them to suffocate, which is way more brutal if you ask me. I bet you don't know these details about the rack. The rack was a popular medieval torture device. It's also fairly simple. They would start by attaching chains to the victim's hands and feet. The chains would then be wrapped around some type of wheel and slowly but surely they'd start to turn it. Sometimes they would even have a bed of nails under the victim where the more they were pulled, the more they were pressed down on the nail bed. Shoulders, elbows, wrists, hips, knees, and ankles would all become dislocated. They claimed that this torture was very noisy, where you could hear every single crack and pop as things became dislocated. Those accused of hearsay would be forced to watch this happen to someone else, and hearing those cracks and pops would almost immediately cause them to confess. If your muscles are stretched too far out, they lose their ability to contract. That causes someone to completely lose their ability to move. They also lose control of all bodily functions. So if you didn't confess and they went through with the rack torture, it was most definitely fatal. I bet you don't know these details about the Blood Eagle. The Blood Eagle has been highly requested from comments. The Blood Eagle was supposedly practiced by the Vikings. How this would work is they would make an incision down the back. They would pull the skin away to expose the spine. They would begin breaking the ribs and pulling them outwards from the spine. When all the ribs were pulled, they resembled wings. And finally, they would remove your lungs. Now, obviously, this would be very fatal. There's a lot of debate whether the Vikings actually performed the Blood Eagle or not. The only evidence that can be found was in Viking poetry. So tell me, do you believe that the Vikings actually performed the Blood Eagle? I bet you don't know this about Pope Gregory the Ninth. He was head of the Catholic Church in the 1200s. He declared that cats were part of devil worship. Yes, cats. And had them mass exterminated. Here's the thing though. It's widely believed that his extermination of cats caused the bubonic plague to spread more rapidly. Less cats meant less rat control, since cats were usually used to control pests. So there's strong belief that Pope Gregory IX had a lot to do with the spread of the bubonic plague in the 1300s. I bet you've never heard of medical cannibalism. It peaked in the 15 and 1600s. They believed that consuming certain parts of the body would heal that exact place on the consumer. Issues with the head? Consume pieces of the head. Issue with the stomach? Consume the stomach. Issue with the eyes? Consume the eyes. That wasn't it though. They said you could cure epilepsy by taking powdered skull and mixing it with molasses. Topically applying human fat was said to relieve pain. They also considered blood to be an elixir. They believed if you drank the blood of a strong person, then you would gain that strength. Drank the blood of someone who was wise, you would gain wisdom. They also took sections of skin and laid it over a place on the body. It was popular to put across a woman's pregnant stomach. They said it relieved cramping and pain. And in the 1600s, there's records of a wine being made from flesh. I bet you don't know this about Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. He was a Mexican politician and general. He proclaimed himself as Napoleon of the West. In 1838, he severely injured his leg during a war, which caused it to be amputated by doctors. So he took it home with him and buried it in his garden. But when he won the presidency in 1842, he exhumed his shriveled leg, paraded it to Mexico City in an ornate coach, and buried it under a cemetery monument in an elaborate state funeral. But his amputated leg didn't remain buried long. 
A group of rioters dug up his leg and destroyed the monument. They then took his severed leg and tied it to a rope and then drug it through the streets of Mexico City in protest. I bet you don't know how false teeth were originally made. In the very beginning, most sets were made of animal teeth. These proved to be uncomfortable and ineffective. So that's when they started venturing into using human teeth in dentures. In the 1700s is when sugar became widely available across Europe. And sugar started to cause the teeth to decay way more rapidly. It wasn't uncommon for a peasant to remove their own tooth and sell it for a quick buck. There was also an issue with grave robbing to obtain teeth. Of course, neither of those were needed when Waterloo teeth became a thing. With over 50,000 young men lost at the Battle of Waterloo, suddenly they realized they had an overabundance of teeth. So it wasn't uncommon at all for someone to be wearing the teeth of a soldier. I bet you've never heard of Carl Tanzler. He fell in love with one of his patients named Elena. Unfortunately, Elena had passed on, but Carl didn't let that stop his love. He paid for Elena's burial so he could have a key to her tomb. Several days after her funeral, he exhumed her grave and brought Elena home with him. With plastic wires and wax, Carl propped Elena's body up. He kept her in his bed and slept next to her every night. He replaced the parts of her that fell off from decay. He would buy her new outfits and clothes. He even used a paper tube to make a makeshift. This went on for seven whole years before he was caught. And how was he caught? He was seen dancing with Elena in his living room through a window. By that time, the statute of limitations for his crime had expired, so the courts could legally do nothing to him. Even crazier, Carl had the audacity to ask the family for Elena back. When the family refused, he made a model of her, where he lived out the rest of his life as a free man with a fake version of Elena. I bet you didn't know this about James Jameson. Yes, as in the Jameson Whiskey. He signed up for an expedition to the Congo. He claimed he was going for relief efforts. At his first opportunity, James Jameson paid a tribe six handkerchiefs for a 10-year-old girl as a slave. He then took her to a hut of a cannibal tribe, where he said, this is a present from a white man and I wish to see her eaten. The tribe did as they were asked. And the whole time James Jameson watched while taking sketches and doing watercolor paintings of what he was witnessing. When he got back, the press got a hold of this. When confronted asking James Jameson if he did this, he proudly said he only paid six handkerchiefs for the girl and he never denied what had happened. I bet you didn't know there was another victim from Lincoln's assassination. Clara Harris and Henry Rathbone. They were invited by the first lady, Mary Todd Lincoln. They originally weren't even supposed to be there that night. Henry attempted to stop John Wilkes Booth. In his attempt, he was stabbed, but he survived his injuries. Years later, after Henry and Clara's wedding, it was revealed that Clara had never thrown away the bloodstained dress. It was kept in a walled off closet. She claimed she kept it so she could speak to Lincoln's ghost. Henry claimed that he was haunted by Lincoln's spirit. He claims the spirit overwashed him with guilt for being unable to stop John Wilkes Booth. He claimed Lincoln's spirit pushed him to shoot Clara and then stab himself. Unfortunately, Clara succumbed to her injuries, but Henry did not. Fortunately, Henry was stopped by a groundskeeper as he attempted to attack their children. From his claims that Lincoln's ghost made him do it, Henry spent out the rest of his life in an insane asylum. I bet you never heard of the gibbet. Gibbeting was a practice of taking criminals and putting them in human-shaped cages, where they would then hang them in public places, usually areas where they could be seen most by the public eye. They would be hung 30 feet in the air to make sure they weren't tampered with, and whoever was put in there was left there. They would succumb to hunger, dehydration, or exposure. The body would stay in the gibbet for years. The public would have to be cautious when walking underneath it. Slowly over time, all that would be left would be a skeleton. I bet you've never heard of the Spanish tickler. This device was used in most of Europe in the Middle Ages. And how would it work? It was simply used to tear the victim's flesh from the bone. They would start by tying someone to a table or a post. They started on the limbs, tearing muscles and tendons from the body. They would slowly move towards the victim's chest and back. And unfortunately, if you were still alive, they would end up at your face last. The Spanish tickler was pretty simple. Imagine brass knuckles with four razor sharp claws. Sometimes the victim would be hoisted into the air and the Spanish tickler would be stuck on a pole. So they'd be hanging above ground while still being tortured by the Spanish tickler. More often than not, it was fatal. 
Some victims were spared, but they were left completely disfigured. I bet you didn't know the movie The Exorcist was loosely based on true events. The Exorcism of Roland Doe. The boy was 14 years old and they claimed he had been possessed by the devil. Now this took place over the 1940s. The family claimed that after the death of another family member, strange things started happening. Strange noises, floating objects, furniture moving on its own. But these events would only happen when the young boy was around. So the family turned to their pastor for help. They claimed the pastor saw these events and told them absolutely not. They needed to contact a Catholic priest. Supposedly the boy underwent many different exorcisms. In one, he supposedly slipped his wrist from one of the restraints, pulled a spring from the mattress, and slashed the arm of the priest. There was claims of the boy levitating off the bed, the bed violently shaking, objects levitating and flying around the room. They also said the boy would speak in a deep guttural voice and had an aversion to anything that was sacred. There were three priests in attendance. One of the priests claimed to see the words hell and evil appear on the young boy's skin. And at one point, supposedly, the young boy broke one of the priest's nose. Supposedly, after all the exorcisms, they claimed Roland Doe went on to live a very normal life. They also claimed 48 different people witnessed these exorcisms. Do you think they were legit? I bet you didn't know that post-mortem photography was a pretty big thing in the mid-1800s. Believe it or not, it was more than likely this is the only photograph they had of their loved one. There's one way to very easily spot post-mortem photography. Because of the exposure and a live human being's inability to stand perfectly still, in the photos, the live family members would be slightly blurry, but those who had passed on would be crystal clear. Sometimes this would be the only time families would get together to even take a photo. They would also make the living siblings pose with their deceased sibling. But this was a pretty normal thing back then. As medical science progressed over the years, there was no need for postmortem photography anymore. But there's still plenty of postmortem photographs that we can look back on. I bet you've never heard of Japan's Killing Stone, or why it's been in the news lately. There's a famous volcanic rock in Japan that is said to kill anyone that comes in contact with it. It's said to possess the soul of the demon Tamamo Nome. She was disguised as a beautiful woman, but she truly was a evil nine-tailed fox demon. And they said inside this volcanic rock is where she was trapped. They claim that this rock continuously spews poisonous gas. But what's the big deal, right? For unexplained reasons, they found the volcanic rock split in half. So now they're saying Tamamo Nome, a demon that's almost a thousand years old, is now released. So there's been quite a bit of panic about it. Oh, I almost forgot. The volcanic rock split just earlier this month.